Hi everyone and welcome to Butchery 101, the channel where we break down and demystify meat and meat related topics so y'all can have the meat buying and eating experience you deserve. Hey everyone, so there are lots of cool new significant changes slowly starting to happen at a systemic level regarding the meat industry and in order to talk about these things we need to have a basic understanding of some terms. I was working on a breakdown of the newly released Biden-Harris competition in meat plan, but realized there's a lot of stuff in here that we just don't typically include in meat conversations explicitly. But those are the things that really dictate our meat buying, eating, and producing experiences. Many of us, consumers, producers, and workers, like meat cutters and butchers, move about our meat system without broader knowledge of the system in general. And we'll have certain experiences like changes in meat prices, meat quality, worker situations, and recalls that sometimes seem super confusing and kind of nonsensical until you zoom out and perceive the entire system as a whole. Like discrepancies in prices in commodity meat versus local meat is huge and confusing and oftentimes the burden of education falls on consumers and retail workers. Like what does local even mean, etc, etc. So before we cover things like the newly released Biden-Harris competition in meat plan, I'd like to set a baseline of terms that will really, really help us more effectively discuss these things. In addition to covering the president's meat plan, we'll also cover some of these terms more in depth individually in the future. Let me know in the comments which ones you want more elaboration on and if you have meat or meat adjacent terms that you'd like to be better defined. And a lot of these terms and concepts make the most sense slash are easiest to conceptualize when discussing them in context. So we're going to cover an overview of the journey from livestock animal to plate. Again, this won't be comprehensive. It'll be very broad and we'll just zoom in for the choice terms that I want to highlight before moving forward with the discussion of legislature. Here are the five general phases that meat takes to get to your plate. There is lots of room for variation depending on how slash where you get your meat, but uh, for the purposes of our discussion today, these are the general steps. Number one, live animals. Number two, harvest. Number three, fabrication slash processing, um, preserving and packaging included. Sales, number four, and then number five, consumption. Live animals. Now, there are a lot of things to cover in this sector from conventional farming to regenerative agriculture to all of the things wrong with both of these situations, but we'll get into that stuff sometime soon. But first, I think we need to acknowledge how little most of us know slash our lack of knowledge on this subject. So I wanna talk about natural animal behaviors and animal welfare. It's really important that we start to think of farmers as intelligent subject matter experts and not just like some yokels to be ignored. We ignore, infantilize, and insult them to our own detriment, as is often the case. And on an ethical level, animal welfare really does mean a lot to me and was one of the greatest motivating factors for me to really pay attention to the meat I was eating. Again, I didn't really start to understand what the animals needed until I started researching. This often took the form of connecting with my local farmers whose principles aligned with mine and then visiting them to learn about what they're doing. This happened recently when I visited Lazy R Ranch, a regeneratively run cattle and sheep ranch in Eastern Washington for New Cowgirl Camp, which is an immersive on-farm workshop co-facilitated and taught by a beef rancher slash former veterinarian. And she taught us a bunch about low stress animal care and health. So now that's part of what I think of when it comes to animal welfare. Keep an eye out for a few video essays on this channel about them. But ultimately, we as the mostly urban and suburban consumers of meat, and all food actually, need to defer to the subject matter experts who are doing the right thing in their respective fields. We'll cover this more thoroughly in a future video, but this part of the journey is where most of the choices are made that affect the quality, nutritional value, and flavor of the meat. Depending on the animal, a diverse diet, uh, the ability to express natural tendencies, clean environment relative to the species needs, etc. Finishing. 
This is a process where they take the live animals, often cattle or pigs, and give them special treatment to prepare to become meat. In some scenarios for pigs, they are fed mostly acorns or hazelnuts in the month leading up to slaughter. This can enhance the flavor and fat content of the meat. Cattle meant to be beef can also sometimes be finished in, on corn and soy to increase the fat in the meat. They'll also often be restricted to smaller spaces. Again, we'll go into this in a different video. These are vastly different circumstances from the ideal natural diets and activities for these animals. And this step is where poor health and safety standards for the animals is very common. I just wanna take a moment to tease a certain term that is extremely relevant here, but too large a subject to tackle in this particular video, which is a CAFO. Um, that's an acronym for a concentrated animal feeding operation. Again, lots, lots more to talk about about this particular step, but for now, we're going to move on. Number two, harvest. This is one of the most important pieces to the meat puzzle, but it's honestly one of the least respected and examined portions of the entire process. Fun fact, um, I guess, this is also where most meat packing companies enter the scene, especially for beef and pork. For chicken, it's a little bit earlier than this. Large chicken companies often have control over the entire life cycle of the animal, but more on that in a minute. And remember what I said about the life of the animal dictating most of the factors that we perceive as quality in terms of flavor and nutritional value. A poor slaughter can undo all of the work put in ahead of this. For example, an animal that is stressed at the time of slaughter has hormones like cortisol running through its veins, affecting the pH of the muscles, and then ultimately many of the characteristics of the meat, including texture, blood content, water retention, among other things. It also happens so often on the large industrial scale that they have terms and categories for the different ways a botched slaughter produces undesirable meat. For example, in pork, there's something called PSE, which is pale, soft exudative due to, I believe, a higher pH caused by a stressed animal. And what that means is that the animal is stressed during the time of slaughter, and so the meat itself, once if you were to say get like a pork chop or a tenderloin out of that particular stressed animal, it would be pale, like the color would be a lot lighter, it would be abnormally soft, and exudative means that it's giving off water in like an unnatural way. There's also an animal welfare piece to this section because remember that the animal was alive as it entered this phase of the meat journey and there are ways to minimize the emotional and physical stress slash damage to the animal before slaughter. And even aside from the resulting shoddy meat and the ultimate death of the animal, there are ethical considerations to make regarding this step. And just like with the animal's life, I as a suburban slash urban dweller need to shift my thinking away, shift my thinking about the expertise, knowledge, and general status of the professionals who do this work. It was super eye-opening once I started actually interacting and following butchers and slaughter folk who do this work. Let me know in the comments if you'd appreciate further discussion about unaliving and death phobia and harvest, because truly butchers and slaughtermen have a very unique perspective on that. But for now, let's talk about a couple significant terms. Slaughterhouse slash abattoir. From Wikipedia, uh, slaughterhouse, also called abattoir, is a facility where animals are slaughtered to provide food for humans. Slaughterhouses supply meat, which then becomes the responsibility of a pack packaging facility. There are many forms of this, ranging from mobile slaughter units to huge packing houses where live animals enter and processed meat leaves. We'll go more into depth about the different types, the costs slash benefits of each type, including animal welfare, workers' rights, public safety, meat quality, environmental concerns, etc. etc. Suffice it to say, this is very hard work and needs to be done well. Slaughterman. This is the professional, individual, or team of professionals who perform the act of taking the animal's life. In small operations, it's often a team of two to three people. In larger contexts, there will be a larger team with stations that handle each individual step. Sometimes in on-farm situations, these professionals are also called butchers. Like, oh, the butcher is coming by on Friday to harvest these animals. 
Again, I just want to reiterate that the slaughter step is extremely important and an absolutely integral part to us being able to eat meat and that we all need to challenge our notions of what this job takes and whether we value the people doing this work enough. Spoiler alert, we don't. Number three. Fabrication slash processing, preserving and packaging. Meat packing company slash processors. Again, meat packing companies are very much involved in this part of the process. In fact, probably the majority of what we think of as a meat packing company is in this section. What is meatpacking? From foodprint.org, meatpacking refers to the process of turning livestock into meat, including slaughter, processing, packaging, and distribution. These days, the top meatpacking companies do not just produce meat, they also control how animals are raised long before slaughter. In the chicken industry, companies oversee the process from chick genetics through supermarket packaging. In the beef industry, cattle come under the control of big meat packers four to six months before slaughter. And just for an alternative answer, this is from dictionary.com. The business or industry of slaughtering cattle and other meat animals and processing the carcasses for sale, sometimes including the packaging of processed meat products. Preserving and packaging. Cut and wrap facilities. A cut and wrap facility is one that receives the carcasses of the animal after harvest that will have been eviscerated and dressed in a way such that it's just meat and bones. And this is where meat cutters and butchers will fabricate the meat. Fabrication is another word for butchering. And then as the name suggests, a cut and wrap facility will also handle the packaging of the meat. Some, some places will also include smoking and curing services as well, in addition to distribution services. I also want to talk about butchers in this context because the term butcher has a huge spectrum of what it could possibly mean and essentially a butcher is involved in the process from the slaughter up until sales. And each type of butchery is very different and I feel like it's really easy to think of this in like a hierarchy like some butchers are better than others or some types of butchers are better than others like, or like meat cutters aren't as good as butchers or vice versa etc. But I really want us to think critically about that. And kind of shift our thinking away from hierarchy and more towards what is better suited to each individual sector. So you'll see in this, especially in this breakdown, that each different step in the process is very different and very particular and in my experience as a professional your merit is more about your skill set and aptitudes being well suited for the particular business you're working for for example i as a whole animal butcher and a restaurant like steakhouse butcher would be really useful for those contact but i wouldn't necessarily be very good in say a slaughterhouse or grocery setting speaking of grocery settings step four is sales now, sales can happen in a retail or wholesale context. So whole animal butcher shop, there are meat markets, there are grocery stores, and then there's also institutional or wholesale sales, which include restaurants, schools, hospitals, just larger scale purchases of meat from the meat packing house. And again, there's a ton of stuff to cover in this sector, but something I really wanna cover today is the labels in general and how there are multiple types. Some are government regulated like organic. Some are mar from marketing organizations like Certified Humane that have their own independent animal welfare standards that producers need to meet before they buy into having this label available. And some mean absolutely nothing, like all natural. And some are trying to sell a feature that sounds good but isn't actually important like vegetarian fed chicken. Chicken as birds are fine eating bugs and worms. Like the vegetarianism for a chicken is not the flex you think it is. There are also a lot of misleading ones like cured versus uncured and we'll definitely go into that much more in depth later on. But really quickly, I wanna cover that a cured product versus an uncured product is just a difference in what type of curing salt they use. The cured version will use pink salt, like synthetically derived nitrates and nitrites, and an uncured version will use nitrates and nitrites from a natural source like celery powder or cherry juice. And generally, neither is necessarily better than the other. 
Again, I also want to touch base on the term butcher here because of how wide a spectrum it is that butchers can and cannot do. And finally, let's get to step five, which is consumption. I've done a few videos on here uh, on this channel about what to do with meat once it's in your home, from butchery to charcuterie to general cooking advice, so hit up my tutorials here. And obviously, we're going to cover a bunch more on this sector in the future, but for now, this is just where the meat meets its end user. Really quick, before we get too deep into any of the other terms, I just want to point out that the government, federal and state, have things to say slash legislation and are involved in pretty much every step of the process. Like, there are certain ways that are lawful that you raise animals. For example, like they recently passed Proposition 12 in California that dictates the amount of space that animals get in their pens, which I think is a really great step forward in ana for animal welfare. The the way that things are harvested. Anyway, the, every single step is touched by the government. Let's talk about meat packers. I want to note where in this process the meat packers are involved. A couple examples of meat packing companies are Tyson, you'll recognize them as in mostly the chicken sector. In the beef sector, you're thinking uh, we mostly have JBS. And then in pork, one of the largest meat packers is Smithfield. There's also IBP. It's funny because I'm kind of drawing a blank as I'm recording this voiceover, but then I realize like, oh, there's honestly only like a dozen of these that are truly significant. We'll get more into that in a little bit. The next term I want to cover is trade association, which on my chart here, I'm going to split into two different groups. But generally, um, according to Wikipedia, a trade association, also known as industry trade group, business association, sector association, or industry body, is an organization founded and funded by businesses that operate in a specific industry. An industry trade association participates in public relations activities such as advertising, education, publishing, lobbying, and political donations, but its focus is collaboration between companies. Associations may offer other services such as producing conferences, holding networking or charitable events, or offering classes or educational materials. So first, I want to talk about industry groups slash checkoffs. Also, according to Wikipedia, Checkoffs are all paid by the meat packers in the checkoff program facilitated by the USDA to create and grow a market for their products. Um, a few examples are the American Egg Board, American Lamb Board, and the Cattlemen's Beef, Cattlemen's Beef Board. These organizations are responsible for familiar American advertising campaigns, including Milk Does Body Good, the Got Milk Milk Mustache series, pork, the other white meats, the incredible edible egg, and beef, it's what's for dinner. One of the questions I get asked most often is, why is goat not that popular a meat? Or why is rabbit not that popular a meat? And the answer is these trade associations and how one of their goals is to create a market for their product and goat and rabbit don't have that kind of representation so it's not necessarily like oh like there's a there's something wrong with goat meat or there's something wrong with rabbit meat it's just a marketing situation where the producers of those different types of meats don't have the kind of representation that the beef pork and chicken industries do now, I just want to point out that if you're like me and you want to understand people's motivations for doing things, keep in mind that the meat packers are the ones funding these industry groups, lobby groups. According to Wikipedia, in politics, lobbying, persuasion, or interest representation is the act of lawfully attempting to influence the actions, policies, or decisions of government officials, most often legislators, or members of regulatory agencies. This is paid for largely by the main meat packers, but other funds as well. 
And again, their main job is to influence lawmakers into writing legislature that favors their clients. Or they'll write the legislature themselves and allow lawmakers to just copy their homework. Now, one of these trade associations is uh, called NAMI, that's short for North American Meat Institute. Um, these are often the people who speak to the press on behalf of the large meat packers. And so knowing why people are motivated to say the things that they say, I personally find it very difficult to take them very seriously at all. I've covered this in two different stories recently, um, one video about the Proposition 12 in California, and then last week's video where a spokesperson from NAMI said that concentration has nothing to do with price. And yeah, I kind of call bullshit on that. This one is also super awkward because if you didn't know that they were trade associations, you might think that they're official government agents. They published the Meat Buyer's Guide and essentially set the nation's standard cut sheet. Now, it's not all terrible what they do, full disclosure, I just want to be fair, but like a lot, a lot of it is. Sorry, I don't have all the answers necessarily in this. Again, this is going to have to be like kind of a shorter take on these things, but I just want to give you guys like a brief overview of what it is that we're talking about. Finally, I want to cover the term monopoly from Wikipedia. In law, a monopoly is a business entity that has significant market power, that is the power to charge overly high prices, which is associated with a decrease in social surplus. In meat, this is exactly what we're talking about when we're concerned about so few companies controlling 85% of the meat market. Pretty much what they say goes and none of the rest of us can say or do anything about it. In scenarios like this, you'd hope that a governing body that looks out for all of its citizens would step in to regulate such a market. No, wouldn't you? All right, so that's about it for this initial look at the meat industry and the journey that meat goes through to get to your plate and some pretty significant terms that I would love for y'all to know in order to have more effective and in-depth conversations about the meat industry in the future. So if this was helpful at all, please go ahead and give me a like and subscribe because we're going to be covering a lot of this stuff more in depth in the future and I would love to be able to talk to y'all about the new changes in legislature at the federal level that is definitely going to affect what you see at the grocery store, at your favorite restaurants, and at your local butcher shops. So let me know if you have any questions in the comments down below and I'll see you guys soon for another episode of Butchery 101. Thanks! Bye!